The Whale Tooth, a short story by Jack London. It was in the early days in Fiji when John Starhurst arose in the mission house at Rua village and announced his intention of carrying the gospel throughout all Viti Levu. Now, Viti Levu means the great land, it being the largest island in a group composed of many large islands, to say nothing of hundreds of small ones. Here and there on the coasts, living by most precarious tenure, was a sprinkling of missionaries, traders, beche de mer fishers, and whale ship deserters. The smoke of the hot ovens arose under their windows, and the bodies of the slain were dragged by their doors on the way to the feasting. The lotu, or the worship, was progressing slowly, and often in crab-like fashion. Chiefs, who announced themselves Christians and were welcomed into the body of the chapel, had a distressing habit of backsliding in order to partake of the flesh of some favourite enemy. Eat or be eaten had been the law of the land, and eat or be eaten promised to remain the law of the land for a long time to come. There were chiefs, such as Tanoa, Tuivekoso, and Tuikilakila, who had literally eaten hundreds of their fellow men. But among these gluttons, Ra Undreundre ranked highest. Ra Undreundre lived at Takiraki. He kept a register of his gustatory exploits. A row of stones outside his house marked the bodies he had eaten. This row was 230 paces long, and the stones in it numbered 872. Each stone represented a body. The row of stones might have been longer had not Ra Undrondre unfortunately received a spear in the small of his back in a bush skirmish on Somo Somo and been served up on the table of Naungavuli, whose mediocre string of stones numbered only 48. The hard-worked, fever-stricken missionaries stuck doggedly to their task, at times despairing and looking forward for some special manifestation, some outburst of Pentecostal fire that would bring a glorious harvest of souls. But cannibal Fiji had remained obdurate. The frizzle-headed man-eaters were loath to leave their flesh pots so long as the harvest of human carcasses was plentiful. Sometimes, when the harvest was too plentiful, they imposed on the missionaries by letting the word slip out that on such a day there would be a killing and a barbecue. Promptly, the missionaries would buy the lives of the victims with stick tobacco, fathoms of calico, and quarts of trade beads. Natheless, the chiefs drove a handsome trade in thus disposing of their surplus live meat. Also, they could always go out and catch more. It was at this juncture that John Starhurst proclaimed that he would carry the gospel from coast to coast of the great land, and that he would begin by penetrating the mountain fastnesses of the headwaters of the Ruwa River. His words were received with consternation. The native teachers wept softly. His two fellow missionaries strove to dissuade him. The king of Roa warned him that the mountain dwellers would surely kai kai him, kai kai meaning to eat, and that he, the king of Rewa, having become Lotu, would be put to the necessity of going to war with the mountain dwellers. That he could not conquer them, he was perfectly aware. That they might come down the river and sack Rua village, he was likewise perfectly aware. But what was he to do? If John Starhurst persisted in going out and being eaten, there would be a war that would cost hundreds of lives. Later in the day, a deputation of Rua chiefs waited upon John Starhurst. He heard them patiently and argued patiently with them, though he abated not a whit from his purpose. To his fellow missionaries, he explained that he was not bent upon martyrdom that the call had come for him to carry the gospel into Viti Levu and that he was merely obeying the Lord's wish. To the traders who came and objected most strenuously of all, he said, Your objections are valueless. They consist merely of the damage that may be done your businesses. You are interested in making money, but I am interested in saving souls. The heathen of this dark land must be saved. John Starhurst was not a fanatic. He would have been the first man to deny the imputation. He was eminently sane and practical. He was sure that his mission would result in good, and he had private visions of igniting the Pentecostal spark in the souls of the mountaineers and of inaugurating a revival that would sweep down out of the mountains and across the length and breadth of the great land from sea to sea 
and to the isles in the midst of the sea. There were no wild lights in his mild grey eyes, but only calm resolution and an unfaltering trust in the higher power that was guiding him. One man only he found who approved of his project, and that was Ravatu, who secretly encouraged him and offered to lend him guides to the first foothills. John Starhurst, in turn, was greatly pleased by Ravatu's conduct. From an incorrigible heathen with a heart as black as his practices, Ravatu was beginning to emanate light. He even spoke of becoming Lotu. True, three years before he had expressed a similar intention and would have entered the church had not John Starhurst entered objection to his bringing his four wives along with him. Ravatu had had economic and ethical objections to monogamy. Besides, the missionary's hair-splitting objection had offended him, and to prove that he was a free agent and a man of honour, he had swung his huge war club over Starhurst's head. Starhurst had escaped by rushing in under the club and holding on to him until help arrived. But all that was now forgiven and forgotten. Ravatu was coming into the church not merely as a converted heathen, but as a converted polygamist as well. He was only waiting, he assured Starhurst, until his oldest wife, who was very sick, should die. John Starhurst journeyed up the sluggish Rua in one of Ravatu's canoes. This canoe was to carry him for two days. When the head of navigation reached, it would return. Far in the distance, lifted into the sky, could be seen the great smoky mountains that marked the backbone of the Great Land. All day, John Starhurst gazed at them with eager yearning. Sometimes he prayed silently. At other times he was joined in prayer by Narao, a native teacher, who for seven years had been Lotu, ever since the day he had been saved from the hot oven by Dr. James Ellery Brown at the trifling expense of one hundred sticks of tobacco, two cotton blankets, and a large bottle of painkiller. At the last moment, after twenty hours of solitary supplication and prayer, Narao's ears had heard the call to go forth with John Starhurst on the mission to the mountains. Master, I will surely go with thee, he had announced. John Starhurst had hailed him with sober delight. Truly, the Lord was with him thus to spur on so broken-spirited a creature as Narao. I am indeed without spirit, the weakest of the Lord's vessels, Narao explained, the first day in the canoe. You should have faith, stronger faith, the missionary chided him. Another canoe journeyed up the Rewa that day, but it journeyed an hour astern, and it took care not to be seen. This canoe was also the property of Ravatu. In it was Erirola, Ravatu's first cousin and trusted henchman and in the small basket that never left his hand was a whale tooth. It was a magnificent tooth, fully six inches long, beautifully proportioned, the ivory turned yellow and purple with age. This tooth was likewise the property of Ravatu, and in Fiji, when such a tooth goes forth, things usually happen. For this is the virtue of the whale tooth. Whoever accepts it cannot refuse the request that may accompany it or follow it. The request may be anything from a human life to a tribal alliance, and no Fijian is so dead to honour as to deny the request when once the tooth has been accepted. Sometimes the request hangs fire, or the fulfilment is delayed, with untoward consequences. High up the Rua, at the village of a chief, Mongondro by name, John Starhurst rested at the end of the second day of the journey. In the morning, Attended by Narao, he expected to start on foot for the smoky mountains that were now green and velvety with nearness. Mongondro was a sweet-tempered, mild-mannered little old chief, short-sighted and afflicted with elephantiasis, and no longer inclined toward the turbulence of war. He received the missionary with warm hospitality, gave him food from his own table, and even discussed religious matters with him. Mongondro was of an inquiring bent of mind and pleased John Starhurst greatly by asking him to account for the existence and beginning of things. When the missionary had finished his summary of the creation according to Genesis, he saw that Mongondro was deeply affected. The little old chief smoked silently for some time. Then he took the pipe from his mouth and shook his head sadly. It cannot be, he said. 
I, Mongondro, in my youth, was a good workman with the ads. Yet three months did it take me to make a canoe, a small canoe, a very small canoe. And you say that all this land and water was made by one man. Nay, was made by one God, the only true God, the missionary interrupted. It is the same thing, Mongondro went on, that all the land and all the water, the trees, the fish and bush and mountains, the sun, the moon and the stars were made in six days. No, no. I tell you that in my youth I was an able man, yet did it require me three months for one small canoe. It is a story to frighten children with, but no man can believe it. I am a man, the missionary said. True, you are a man, but it is not given to my dark understanding to know what you believe. I tell you, I do believe that everything was made in six days. So you say, so you say the old cannibal murmured soothingly. It was not until after John Starhurst and Narao had gone off to bed that Erirola crept into the chief's house and after diplomatic speech handed the whale tooth to Mongondro. The old chief held the tooth in his hands for a long time. It was a beautiful tooth and he yearned for it. Also, he divined the request that must accompany it. No, no, whale teeth were beautiful and his mouth watered for it but he passed it back to Erirola with many apologies. In the early dawn, John Starhurst was afoot, striding along the bush trail in his big leather boots, at his heels the faithful Narao, himself at the heels of a naked guide, lent him by Mongondro to show the way to the next village, which was reached by midday. Here a new guide showed the way. A mile in the rear plodded Erirola, the whale tooth in the basket slung on his shoulder, for two days more, he brought up the missionary's rear, offering the tooth to the village chiefs. But village after village refused the tooth. It followed so quickly the missionary's advent that they divined the request that would be made, and would have none of it. They were getting deep into the mountains, and Erirola took a secret trail, cut in ahead of the missionary, and reached the stronghold of the Bully of Gatoka. Now, the bully was unaware of John Starhurst's imminent arrival. Also, the tooth was beautiful, an extraordinary specimen, while the colouring of it was of the rarest order. The tooth was presented publicly. The bully of Gatoka, seated on his best mat, surrounded by his chief men, three busy fly brushes at his back, deigned to receive from the hand of his herald the whale tooth presented by Ravatu, and carried into the mountains by his cousin, Erirola. A clapping of hands went up at the acceptance of the present, the assembled headmen, heralds and fly-brushers crying aloud in chorus, Ah, woy, 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 ah, woy, 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 a tabwa levu, woy, woy, a mudua, mudua, mudua. Soon will come a man, a white man, Erirola began, after the proper pause. He is a missionary man, and he will come today. Ravatu is pleased to desire his boots. He wishes to present them to his good friend, Mongondro, and it is in his mind to send them with the feet along in them, for Mongondro is an old man, and his teeth are not good. Be sure, O Buli, that the feet go along in the boots. As for the rest of him, it may stop here. The delight in the whale tooth faded out of the Buli's eyes, and he glanced about him dubiously yet had he already accepted the tooth. A little thing like a missionary does not matter, Erirola prompted. No, a little thing like a missionary does not matter, the bully answered himself again. Mongondro shall have the boots. Go, you young men, some three or four of you, and meet the missionary on the trail. Be sure you bring back the boots as well. It is too late, said Erirola. Listen, he comes now. Breaking through the thicket of brush, John Starhurst, with Narao close on his heels, strode upon the scene. The famous boots, having filled in wading the stream, squirted fine jets of water at every step. Starhurst looked about him with flashing eyes. Upborne by an unwavering trust, untouched by doubt or fear, he exulted in all he saw. He knew that since the beginning of time, he was the first white man ever to tread the mountain stronghold of Gatoka. The grass houses clung to the steep mountainside or overhung the rushing Rua. 
On either side towered a mighty precipice. At the best, three hours of sunlight penetrated that narrow gorge. No coconuts nor bananas were to be seen, though dense, tropic vegetation overran everything, dripping in airy festoons from the sheer lips of the precipices and running riot in all the crannied ledges. At the far end of the gorge, the Rua leaped 800 feet in a single span, while the atmosphere of the rock fortress pulsed to the rhythmic thunder of the fall. From the Bewley's house, John Starhurst saw emerging the Bewley and his followers. I bring you good tidings, was the missionary's greeting. Who has sent you? The Bully rejoined quietly. God. It is a new name in Viti Levu, the Bully grinned. Of what islands, villages, or passes may he be chief? He is the chief over all islands, all villages, all passes, John Starhurst answered solemnly. He is the Lord over heaven and earth, and I am come to bring his word to you. Has he sent whale teeth? was the insolent query. No, but more precious than whale teeth is the... It is the custom between chiefs to send whale teeth, the bully interrupted. Your chief is either a niggard or you are a fool to come empty-handed into the mountains. Behold, a more generous than you is before you. So saying, he showed the whale tooth he had received from Erirola. Narao groaned. It is the whale tooth of Ravatu, he whispered to Starhurst. I know it well. Now are we undone. A gracious thing, the missionary answered, passing his hand through his long beard and adjusting his glasses. Ravatu has arranged that we should be well received. But Narao groaned again and backed away from the heels he had dogged so faithfully. Ravatu is soon to become Lotu, Starhurst explained, and I have come bringing the Lotu to you. I want none of your Lotu, said the Bully proudly and it is in my mind that you will be clubbed this day. The bully nodded to one of his big mountaineers, who stepped forward, swinging a club. Narao bolted into the nearest house, seeking to hide among the woman and mats, but John Starhurst sprang in under the club and threw his arms around his executioner's neck. From this point of vantage, he proceeded to argue. He was arguing for his life, and he knew it, but he was neither excited nor afraid. It would be an evil thing for you to kill me, he told the man. I have done you no wrong, nor have I done the bully wrong. So well did he cling to the neck of the one man that they dared not strike with their clubs, and he continued to cling and to dispute for his life with those who clamoured for his death. I am John Starhurst, he went on calmly. I have laboured in Fiji for three years, and I have done it for no profit. I am here among you for good. Why should any man kill me? To kill me will not profit any man. The bully stole a look at the whale tooth. He was well paid for the deed. The missionary was surrounded by a mass of naked savages, all struggling to get at him. The death song, which is the song of the oven, was raised, and his expostulations could no longer be heard. But so cunningly did he twine and wreathe his body about his captors that the death blow could not be struck. Erirola smiled, and the bully grew angry. Away with you, he cried. A nice story to go back to the coast. A dozen of you and one missionary, without weapons, weak as a woman, overcoming all of you. Wait, O oh bully, John Starhurst called out from the thick of the scuffle, and I will overcome even you, for my weapons are truth and right, and no man can withstand them. Come to me, then, the bully answered for my weapon is only a poor, miserable club, and as you say, it cannot withstand you. The group separated from him, and John Starhurst stood alone, facing the bully, who was leaning on an enormous, knotted war club. Come to me, missionary man, and overcome me, the bully challenged. Even so will I come to you and overcome you. John Starhurst made answer, first wiping his spectacles and settling them properly, then beginning his advance. The bully raised the club and waited. In the first place, my death will profit you nothing, began the argument. I leave the answer to my club, was the bully's reply. And to every point he made the same reply, 
at the same time watching the missionary closely in order to forestall that cunning run-in under the lifted club. Then, and for the first time, John Starhurst knew that his death was at hand. He made no attempt to run in. Bareheaded, he stood in the sun and prayed aloud, the mysterious figure of the inevitable white man who, with Bible, bullet or rum bottle, has confronted the amazed savage in his every stronghold. Even so stood John Starhurst in the rock fortress of the Bouli of Gatoka. Forgive them, for they know not what they do, he prayed. O Lord, have mercy upon Fiji, have compassion for Fiji. O Jehovah, hear us for his sake, thy son, whom thou didst give that through him all men might also become thy children. From thee we came, and our mind is that to thee we may return. The land is dark, O Lord, the land is dark, but thou art mighty to save. Reach out thy hand, O Lord, and save Fiji, poor cannibal Fiji. The bully grew impatient. Now will I answer thee, he muttered, at the same time swinging his club with both hands. Narao, hiding among the women and the mats, heard the impact of the blow and shuddered. Then the death song arose, and he knew his beloved missionary's body was being dragged to the oven as he heard the words, Drag me gently, drag me gently, for I am the champion of my land. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. Next, a single voice arose out of the din, asking, Where is the brave man? A hundred voices bellowed the answer, Gone to be dragged into the oven and cooked. Where is the coward? the single voice demanded. Gone to report, the hundred voices bellowed back. Gone to report, gone to report. Narao groaned in anguish of spirit. The words of the old song were true. He was the coward, and nothing remained to him but to go and report. 